is. So for, for those people who don't know Ram, oh. Ram has been here for how many years? Over 30 years now. Sunita knows, Sunita keeps track. Over 30 years. <laughs> Yes, non-stop, yes. Non, non, <laughs> not non-stop, but it's been a good thing. Um, you know, the Bible says we should give honor to whom honor is due. And um, Ram has been a really faithful uh, steward here, not just here, but across the globe. <laughs> so we're really blessed to have him. And um, he's going to continue um, or end the series, actually, um, <laughs> today and just before he does that perhaps we can just pray for him thank you so father lord we thank you for ram we thank you for the many gifts and many talents you've given him and the way that he's been able to use that lord to to bring you glory and father as he comes to speak now we ask your blessing to be upon him we pray your anointings be upon him we ask that you will give him your words that he'll be able to speak your words with great clarity, um, with conviction, and that it will be backed by the Spirit of God. And that, Lord, even as we listen, our ears will be tuned to what you are saying to us individually and collectively as a church. And that, Father Lord, that your words uh, will work in our hearts, transforming us so that we leave here changed today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I think I'm on the wireless mic, so that's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Bimpe, and thank you for that prayer. And uh, if a message can be passed to the room at the back, we are going to finish early again, because I know when you're teaching Sunday school and you don't know how to phase and paste the material, somebody needs to just tell them it will be as, almost as per last week. So uh, that, that would be good. Bev did ask me, and I said, I don't know what time will be put on. Oh, my word, 11 o'clock, unthinkable. So, <laughs> anyway, a warm welcome to everybody. And if you're here for the first time, I know at least one person, a friend of ours, is here for the first time. Indra Kumar, welcome to, to the church here. Thank you. Well, welcome. He, he just happened to meet Sunita in the bus last week, and she told him I'm preaching, and I said, oh, he, he won't come. And he is here. So, <laughs> our daughters went to the same school and same class. There we are. Anyway, welcome again to everybody. Really good to see you all here. And uh, we have been taken through the subject, through the book of Daniel, by Jason and Ryan. And I had a free hand to what I would say, preach today. Not quite say, but preach from the word of God. <laughs> and uh, uh, Daniel, I just love the book. Uh, it's, uh, the, the, the subtext is uh, life in exile. And it's something I can empathize with because I came to this country in exile. I didn't even have to be let in when I arrived at the airport. And uh, there was, uh, 75 years ago, the partition of India. So my parents were exiled and fled to East Africa. 20 years later, 20 years later, again expelled from East Africa and arrived in London. So uh, here, here I am uh, pre preaching, preaching, preaching this morning. Uh, I read a story recently. Uh, it's about a pastor who preached a sermon on honesty. Uh, one Sunday morning, and the next day, he took the bus to get to his office. And after he paid the fare, he realized that the bus driver had uh, given him way too much change. So during the rest of the journey, he was rationalizing how God has provided him with some extra money he needed for the week, but he just could not live with himself. I mean, he's past Winnie. You know, and before he got off the bus, he said to the driver, driver, you've made a mistake. You've given me too much change. And he proceeded to give the driver back the extra money. The driver smiled. He said, that was no mistake. I was at your church yesterday and heard you preach on honesty. So I decided to put you to a test this morning. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there you are. <laughs> and so <laughs> he passed the test, praise God. <laughs> but, but, but this morning, I want us to look at Three tests which God gave Daniel, and this is just in case God to plan, plans to try them out on you or me today, tomorrow. <laughs> I was struck in these last three sermons that we've had preached so brilliantly by Jason and by Ryan, uh, and what I'll be doing is just bringing it together as Jason requested, and I said, I think that I'll go for that option. 
but how Daniel was able to withstand the trials that he was subjected to. You know, the first thing I want you to note is that these tests that I'm uh, talking about, these tests and trials that he was subject to, they all came before he was thrown into the lion's den. Before. You know, very often this story comes as a Sunday school story, as if the lion's den is the peak and the climax of the whole thing. These tests and trials came before. In a sense, the outcome in that, in that lion's den was almost inconsequential. You know, Daniel would not have acted differently, and I say this confidently, because whatever mattered happened before then. So let's look at these three tests. Again, just to give you the broad framework, because we've been through these three, uh, th these three uh, uh, experiences. There was the character and integrity test. That's, he just arrived as a teenager in Babylon from Jerusalem. So there was the character and integrity test. And that was the first sermon, the first Daniel chapter 1. Then the priority test. And maybe this was in his midlife. This is when, if you remember, uh, the, the, the emperor, the king had a dream. Who can guess what dream I had? Who can guess what dream somebody has? Well, uh, 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 Daniel, we, we read what happened in that story. I'll be just summarizing it again for those of you for the first time today or may have missed some of the sermons. Uh, and then there's, that was in his midlife. And then there's the dependency test. And this was when he was uh, in his 70s or 80s. Okay? So now he's an older man and there's this dependency test. And uh, so any one of these three tests, quite honestly, could have broken so many people. But Daniel and his colleagues faithfully withstood them. And I can only assume that the Bible training that Daniel and his uh, mates had received from Saturday school, Shabbat, it was in Jerusalem, and no doubt from his parents at home, until he was taken captive as a teenager, must have been so good, so solid, so thorough that when it came to now living in this new culture, uh, he was able to stand firm in ba Babylon from his teenage years until his 70s and 80s. So what's the context? Daniel was a refugee in exile, along with many others who were taken as captives. Life was difficult. They must have had a lot of questions, doubts. How could they trust God after all he had sent them into foreign exile, hadn't he? And on this point, I just go off my notes. You know, I heard from another very amazing preacher who said, when people, when God moves people, when people go into exile, it's all part of his plan. Remember, it's part of his plan. We can't argue with that. And so, even though they didn't know that, just imagine what a huge challenge it must have been for them. From being the majority community in Jerusalem, they're now the minority in Babylon. You know, I do not have to imagine the shock they must have felt and experienced. It was what my family must have experienced when my father was given 24 hours notice to leave East Africa. 24 hours. Boom. You're out tomorrow morning. And we were all thinking, oh, goodness, he's the head of the house. He's in charge. We are 15, 18, whatever of us. What happens next? You know, travels to London. There's no, no home in London. Where, where does he go? Uh, very limited resources. You're only allowed to take out I think 200 pounds, 100 pounds or whatever. Oh, and, and he came in January. The shift in temperature from 30s and 40s to freezing cold. I know all about that. Arriving on the 2nd of January, minus 2 from 40. So I can exp share some of that. And, you know, the culture shift, the culture shock. I remember arriving in London. And, you know, we come from a very conservative, restricted society. You know, we were being brought up like we were in India of the 1940s because that's when we were expelled. So that was the picture of drum, and that's how we were brought up. You now come into London, 1960s, drug-fueled, flower power. <laughs> you know, I, I, I arrived in my three-piece suit. I told you, I did not feel a fool. <laughs> oh, man, you know, I'm at the airport thinking, I've now got a three-piece suit. I'm coming to London. Yeah. Everyone's in these shirts. And, all, you know, and then and if you put on the radio, you've got Tony Blackburn, Radio Caroline, filling the airwaves with Jimi Hendrix, the Beatles, Rolling Stones. What a shift. You know, uh, Sunita and I had the privilege, during 189, there was Mission 89 going on. Billy Graham was visiting London. Some of you may not have been born then, but anyway, he was here, came to England for his mission. 
And uh, uh, for that particular one, I know this church, the elders then had given me the responsibility to oversee it. But leaving that aside, we had the privilege of being invited to the guild hall through one of our, so my, my stockbroker friends. He was a Christian and he had tickets and he invited us to guild hall for this amazing dinner. And Billy Graham was the speaker. It was in honor of Billy Graham. And in the invitation, they had small print. No, none of this is in my notes, by the way, but I've got time today, so I'm going to tell you what happened. <laughs> so, you know, in small print, there was uh, Billy Graham. You're invited very specially to the crypt of St. Paul's, or of the Guild Hall, and uh, you can meet Billy Graham. So we, we read it, <laughs> you know, and uh, we, we, we went, the meeting finished, we went downstairs, and we were the only ones there, and Billy Graham. So, wow, what a privilege. So walked up to him, sir, that was an amazing speech you gave upstairs. He shared some amazing stuff uh, uh, during that meeting, uh, which I can't repeat here, but it was just brilliant. And uh, that he said, I said to him, how's it been, sir? And uh, just one-on-one, -on -one, he said, the world has changed. I came here in 1956. People believed the Bible was true. People believed that Jesus really existed. Now I'm speaking in, 80, in, in, in 89 to people who think it's a fairy story and that it's really, well, we will go along with it. That was already in 89, he said. So he said, I had to shift the way I preached about the good news of Jesus. You know, when such dramatic changes happen with culture, whatever your background, whatever your faith, doubts about life and the future dominate your thinking. You know, what will happen next? I have a right here. What will go on? And the message of the book of Daniel is a response to these doubts and to these difficult times. That's really the bottom line of the message of Daniel. You know, imagine if you heard that your country was invaded by a foreign nation. Just imagine. that Before the TV is overtaken by the invading army's uh, uh, censors, we hear reports of churches being burned to the ground all over the land. So you leave your house, whether it's on the Gallup or on Chilton Road or wherever, you leave your house and you pass by here and the church is burned to the ground. There is no church, just imagine. Friends, church family members, they're all weeping on their knees, crying. The building where you were married, where you were baptized, where you worship, where your, where your, where your loved ones' funerals were held, no more. You then say, where's the school? So you go past your old area with the school. Gone, in the football field, destroyed, uh, uh, musical instru instruments, all in the bins. You know, that's what young Daniel was experiencing when he started on his long journey to Babylon. That's just imagine. His world was shaken. Every sacred place he cher cherished was raised to the ground. And that journey from Jerusalem to Babylon... Uh, would have been around 680 miles, just to imagine the picture. And so uh, if they had marched through the ancient city of Damascus, uh, uh, you know, like walking from London to Scotland, okay? And they were deported to the modern nation of Iraq, just to get the geography. You've seen all this on the news, haven't you? Iraq and the war, and we're all experts on the Middle East now, aren't we? And, and on, and on, and on, and on um, uh, where's the current thing taking place? Russia and Ukraine. You know, we all know the names we never heard in our lives. So, okay, I'm telling you, they went to the modern nation of Iraq. Um, I did look up Babylon. It's no longer the capital. It's now, um, what's the capital of Iraq? Checking. Baghdad. Right, got it. Right. But th this is about 80 miles away. It still exists, the site. And so what did the Babylonians do? They looked for the best and brightest men in the country they conquered. Young men. They wanted the teenagers, uh, the smartest, the socially well-to-do, uh, the creme de la creme, you know, the first picks, the five-star recruits. That's what they wanted. And Daniel, who was just a te teenager, was separated from many of his friends and family members. What was Babylon like? It was a city bigger, it was stronger, shinier than anything Jerusalem, the, the boys from Jerusalem had seen. And as they drew closer, there was a large bridge uh, that they had to cross before entering into one of the many glorious gates of the city. Uh, can you imagine how intimidating that scene must have been for these boys? As they walked across the bridge, I'm sure and I say this also from experience, I'm sure the city, city walls were filled with Babylonian teenagers jeering and hurling insults at these young men. And they were heartbroken. 
you know, these things happen today. It happened to me. You know, you walk out and <gasps> you're different. You get jeered at. So these boys, can you imagine what they were going through? And we notice that Nebu Chadnazar, I'll just call him Nebs, okay? Make it easy. I can't keep going Nebu Chadnazar, it appears here. So, so please forgive me, but I'm calling him Nebs. That's much easier for me, all right? So, so what was old Nebs trying to do? He, he wanted to reprogram Daniel and his friends. He wanted to reprogram them. He ordered the chief of his court officials to choose these young men who would be easily molded by their new environment. So we read, and this is from the Bible I read now, Daniel 1, verse 3. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility, really selecting them from the you know, top draw. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. They were trying to Babylonianize the next generation. It's a tactic, a tactic of colonization, a tactic for anyone over, taking over a country. You've just, that's, that's what happens. That's part of conquest. They sought to isolate them from their spiritual heritage. They would have known these boys would have been brought up, and that community would have been brought up. And so they did everything possible to get their church out of them. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them new names. Now, why did he give them new names? To change the names. So Daniel, Belteshazzar, Hananiah, Shadrach, Mishael, Meshach, Azariah, Abednego, Daniel 1.7. Why did they change the name? Why is such a big deal? Now, notice, Daniel and Mishael, they end with the letters L. Just as an aside, I'm learning, I've been learning Hebrew because my grandchildren live in Israel, and so I could really understand this point because I recognize it. You know, when you say Dan E L, L, God is my strength. Yeah, that's that's what that name means. And then when you uh, uh, God is my judge. Let me get the right right vocabulary. You, God is my judge. Mi Shaels means who is like God. Mi Shael. Azaria means one who Yahweh helps. When you ask someone for help in Israel, you said, Azar Tli, help me, Azar. Az Azariah, Yahweh is my help. Hananiah, Yahweh is gracious. Now, every time they're called by that name, they know what they're referring to, and they know which God and which, they know their culture and faith. Change their names and they may forget it. So they got names, the new names were named after Marduk, Bel, and Nebo, Babylonian gods, and you can track that if you do your Google searches, you'll find it. They're changing it. Remember these new gods. They were the targets of an intense re-education program. They hoped to erase their faith identities, connect them with gods they were, that were cherished by the world's value system, the new world. You know, I make this point, and I stress it every time I make it. Bring up our young people with solid Bible teaching, branded deep into their DNA. It's so important. We need to. You know, the work... You do, Nikki, and Bev is doing, and others are doing, and whoever is involved in the, with the young people, it's so important. You've got to do it. Because if you don't do it, when they go to Babylon, be sure Babylon will get them, and Babylon will try to rebrand them. They really, really need it. And then the next, after the name change, reprogramming their minds. Okay, you've got the name change, you've got them in a new, you're trying to get them into a new diet, which we all know they're rejected. Mind, youth without blemish, from the Bible here, Daniel 1.4. Good appearance, skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and all the wine that he drank. Oh, my word. I'd love to see that bottle. <laughs> You know what I mean? Those who eat food at restaurants, you look at the bottle and you, all the wine that he drank must have been amazing. They, they were to be educated for three years and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Three years. <laughs> it was a three-year spiritual reprogramming for these godly Hebrew teenagers. In place of God creating the heavens and earth, what were they told? There is another creation story that I know comes out of Babylon. They would have been taught that one. Uh, they were taught about omens, they were taught about magic, sorcery, astrology. 
What happens if you go into a Babylonian school located in a Babylonian city, taught by Babylonian teachers, reading Babylonian literature? Would it be surprising if you would start to think like a Babylonian? You know, it just wasn't about eating your vegetables, this story. <laughs> There's more to it here. Can you imagine the kind of confidence these teens had in God's word to withstand three years of indoctrination? Can you imagine the discipleship process their parents and their rabbis had done for these four lads to stand firm? And one more can you imagine. <laughs> can you imagine the faithfulness of these four teenagers given everything that was being thrown at them to get them to adopt the world's values? Just imagine. You know, Satan will use different strategies to make you and me adopt the world's values. Now, some, sadly, he will violently persecute and attack. That's happening in the world. I'm going to India tomorrow. I know that's what I'm going to be hearing from all the Christian leaders. It is bad, really bad. Grim, in fact. But for others, oh, this is an amazing strategy. He will seduce with the king's best foods. Small steps of temptation, you know, isn't big, doesn't come little by little. Just try this. Easy to give into. Well, what difference will it make? Until we are no different from the culture of today. You know, I was reminded of the story about the frogs in water, well-known story. Put a frog in water, raise the temperature slowly, and the frog doesn't know it, and it, it's, it's a proven fact, the frog will die. Put the frog into boiling water and they jump out. It's, it's different. You know, the Babylonians thought they had changed Daniel's character. But in reality, all they did was change his circumstances. Daniel had that inner resolve that, you know, Jason preached in that first sermon, that resolve. He refused to wear the golden handcuffs of a royal daily handout. More to Daniel than meets the eye. He had a deep commitment to the living God that location could not change. He was a man with conviction. There are certain places you don't go. Certain people you don't need to be near. Certain things you don't need to do. Let us remember that when the world says you need to accept this lifestyle or you may lose the deal. Oh, I face that so often in business. And I'm guilty. I know in my early days I gave in, I confess. But as the God's word speaks, you think, oh, I can't keep doing this. It is wrong. Remember the resolve of Daniel. You know, or when this world says, everyone takes a bribe. Oh, man, I face that regularly. Everyone cheats to get ahead. Remember the resolve of Daniel. When Daniel is offered choice food, but food which is non kosher, what does he do? But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. We all desperately need these models of integrity, don't we? They're so difficult to find these days. God knew that, so he's given us a model of integrity. In Daniel, worthy of our imitation in the life of Daniel. And this other thought occurred to me. It wasn't in a commentary, but I, I can't help sometimes thinking offline, you know. And this one was, who would know if he didn't eat this food? Who would know? You know, we went on a course, Sunita and myself. Uh, it's a course for sort of, uh, yeah, for, for a group of people and uh, maybe like us, and we went there. It's a called, uh, uh, When No One Sees, the headline, The Character Dimension of Leadership. Okay, And there was one reading, there a series of readings in that, from Madonna in the modern reading, right up to, to, to starting with Plato. And Plato, if you've if you ever done classics, you'll know that Plato wrote about this ring of Gyges. This ring, and you may have heard the story, if you turn it, you disappear. And if you turn it again, you appear. The question to all of us was, if you turn it and disappear, will your decisions be the same as when you turn it and can be seen. You know, I'll never forget my, uh, my, my boss who, was, who came to this course as well. Oh boy, he did express his anger. He said, you know, and he plays golf. And he said, you know, when I play golf, I know my partner moves the ball, but I don't see it when he does it. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, when no one sees, mate, that's, who knows what goes on. <laughs> so, so, so what happened? 
chapter 1, verse 15, at the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the God took away the choice food and the wine and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge, understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand. Look what he's being prepared for in the next te test. Understand visions and dreams of all kind. And at the end of all that, the king talked with them and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. Now, How did he keep his integrity? That's the question, isn't it? How did he remain trustworthy? Because he passed a second test. And that second test, the priority test, the king asks the wise men to tell him what he had dreamt about to interpret it without telling them what the dream was. No one was able to do this, so he ordered, Kapoor, you know, you, you've had it, mate. You, you, you know, you'd be executed. So we read in chapter 2, verse 14, following on from that order, Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon. They're getting closer, Daniel. Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel, wise man, he went to the king. See, he's reached a senior position where he got access to the king. Not anyone can just go to the king like that. I mean, to write it like that, you think, God, he really had access to the king. And he asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. What does he do? Does he file a constitutional challenge? You know, he's not in that position. He said, oh, I'm going to find a challenge. Or does he, does he, does he set up a protest to march through the, through the streets demonstrating against the injustice of it all? Uh, does he take out a newspaper ad to campaign against this uh, a petition drive? No, he asks for time. Why? So he can pray. Daniel calls a prayer meeting with his friends. Can you imagine? You say, go to the king, say, I need time. What are you going to do, mate? <laughs> Call in a prayer meeting, king. <laughs> and he's looking at you thinking, all right, you do your thing. <laughs> Wait for the chop, mate. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Chapter 2, <laughs> verses 17 to 19. <laughs> Then Daniel returned to his house, explained the matter to his friends Hananiah, uh, uh, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to do what? To plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision, and then Daniel praised the God of heaven. Prayers answered, hallelujah, he got it. You know, what does it take to get you and me onto our knees? Is it a tragedy? A real crisis? I mean, it's good when there is something that is happening like that. You set up immediately to pray. I know when we were in our church in Switzerland, one of our friends was diagnosed with breast cancer. What did the church do? We all instantly, prayer meeting, let's faithfully pray for uh, um, Helen? Helen? Laura. Let's pray for Laura. And so we, we, we got round and got on our knees and we, you know, we literally did that as a matter of fervency. But, you know, we can never use the excuse we are too busy to pray. Daniel had been praying as a habit of life. He was one of the top government officials of his entire nation, remember? Somehow the priority of prayer was so important that he always made it a point to carve out the necessary time for his daily schedule to come before God in prayer, pouring out all his fears and worries of praise to God. And I'll never forget my nephew. He was in the Philippines, uh, 11, maybe, no, maybe 12, 13. I forget now, so some time ago. Anyway, he was in the Philippines, and, he'd and, he, and I heard he'd become a follower of Christ as a young lad. So I asked, how? They said, oh, he was watching this American TV channel, Club 700. I thought, wow, it's Club 700. And watching it, he wrote off for his free Bible. I come from a community where we love free stuff. If it's free, we'll write off and get it, <laughs> whatever happens. And, and he's from the same community as me, my nephew. So here I can imagine he wrote off on this Bible. It's free, I've got it. And he read it, and he started going to church. And he started going to church, this young lad. And his parents suddenly watched him every Sunday, off to church, Bible open, what is going on? So, and the TV sub, so they said, cut your TV subscription, young man. You're not going out on a Sunday anymore. That Bible has been confiscated. So this is what he told his parents. You can take away my Bible. You can stop me going out to church. 
You can cancel my TV subscription, but you cannot stop me from praying. You cannot stop me from praying. I'm going to keep praying. Do what you like. I mean, you know, what are our spiritual priorities like? Are they where they, are they, where they ought to be? You know, Daniel, Daniel didn't change his behavior for anyone. He wasn't intimidated by these threats. He remained faithful to his priorities. God came first, whatever the consequence. What was the result? He got a reward. The king placed Daniel in a high position, lavished many gifts on him, made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon. Boy, that's uh, Babylon, like becoming the mayor of London, you know, but with even more powers than a current mayor has. Everything. Placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained in the royal court. I mean, that's amazing. Now, how did he stay true to his character and maintain his integrity? Because he passed that second test. He kept his priorities. I'll call them priorities, okay? Trying to remember priorities. He had developed spiritual disciplines that fueled his integrity. Now, how did he keep his priorities? Because he passed the third and most fundamental test of all, the dependency test. And here is the secret to why he passed the previous two tests. He was strong in public because he was dependent in private. He kept to his spiritual disciplines because he had cultivated a relationship of dependency. He was asking God for help, for strength not to fail him. The, the, the administrators, the satraps, if you read Daniel 6, 4, and 5, they looked out for him. He went into his room and he opened his windows and he prayed towards Jerusalem. He wasn't worried who's watching. And if you open your windows and you're praying, people can listen. Who cares? I'm praying. And so these guys work out that this man is not praying because the decree was passed that said, because they then said to the king and said, oh, pass this decree. Anyone who doesn't pray to you, another execution. They love their executions, these guys. And so they said, you know, if he doesn't do it, get him, right? And so they should be thrown into the lion's den. Now your majesty issued the decree, put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. And so he put the decree in writing. And when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, that's he went upstairs, opened the windows, doors, everything. And three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed. And so they went to the king. He's done it, he's praying, so the king sends him into the lion's den, and we all know what happened. He came out untouched, unscathed. That kind of dependency prayer, trust that God knows, trust that God knows best, and trust God to glorify himself through whatever happens to you and me. To conclude, God calls all of us to a life of integrity, to a life of priority, and above all, to a life of dependency. Dependency on him, capital H-I-M. There's an author that I used to enjoy reading. I haven't seen much books from him lately, but a brilliant author about 30 years ago, I must have read him, Ted Engstrom. And he has this anonymous quotation in his book. When wealth is lost, nothing is lost. You know, I can testify to, to that. Our family lost wealth twice. First in partition, and then again in East Africa. It didn't matter. When wealth is lost, nothing is lost. You can make it back. Get a job. Whatever. You get it back. When health is lost, of course, something is lost. You have to acknowledge that. Something is lost. But when character is lost, all is lost. Daniel lost all that he had in terms of personal wealth and freedom, but he never lost his integrity. Daniel didn't know what he would experience in the lion's den, but he knew that God would be with him, and he put his trust in God. You and I do not know what we will experience in the lion's den tomorrow, but you and I can know that God will be with us. What matters more is that you and I pass these three tests today, the integrity test, the priority test, and the dependency test. You know, grandfather was walking out with his grandson one day, and so granddad asks grandson, how far do you think we are from home? Grandpa, I don't know. So the grandfather asks, well... Where are you? Again, the boy said, I don't know. Then the grandfather chuckled and said, sounds to me as if you're lost. The young boy looked up at his grandfather and said, I can't be lost, I'm with you. Ultimately, that is the answer to all that worries or threatens us too. We are never lost. We are always safe, safe in the truest sense of the word when we are with God. That is the message of Daniel. 
you know, the life of Daniel is really a model and an example of how God's people can live in difficult, difficult conditions and come through victoriously. Even as the Jewish people were living in Babylonian captivity, so Christians today, you and I, those of who believe in Jesus, we are pilgrims and exiles in a foreign culture. We, like Daniel, must exercise our faith in God's purposes and leading for our lives. We too must resolve in advance that we will not be defiled by the world. And whether our God delivers us or not from the lion's den, we will remain faithful to him. I'm reminded of the song, Dare to be a Daniel. Anyone here ever sing that song, Dare to be a Daniel? Hey, there you are one. In our connect group, we had one as well. So it's obviously a song that has been sung. In, in Geneva, which was an American plant church, they would sing it quite a bit. So I knew the song, Dare to be a Daniel, Dare to stand alone, Dare to have a purpose firm, and Dare to make it known. And you know, the story of this song is very moving. And I, I just got to share, share, share with you this, the story of the song. It was written by Philip Paul Bliss. He was born in 1838. And by 1876, at the age of 38, he had become probably the second most influential songwriter of his day. And he wrote the song in 1876, age 38. This is the Dare to be a Daniel song for his Sunday school kids. That's what he wrote it for. On Friday, November the 24th, 1876, he sang at a minister's meeting conducted by D.L. Moody, who's a world famous evangelist, certainly in the United States, but those who know the name, yeah, him. Th a thousand preachers were present. And again, reading from the historic records, a favorite song that was sung that touched me because I was doing the book of Daniel for today was, Are Your Windows Open to a Jerusalem? So that's an aside. He also introduced to the gathering a new song that he had just written the music for, he'd written the music for, It Is Well With My Soul. And the words were written by Horatio Spafford, okay? And some of us will have heard the story from this pulpit here. I think my brother-in-law, when he last preached, just before he was taken to the Lord because of COVID, he shared that story, and I'd heard it before as well. Especially when you go to, to, to Tel Aviv in Israel, um, you'll come to a restaurant which, where this place was, thing, the American colony, the hotel. This is where it is today. Three years earlier, Spafford had sent his wife and children to Europe on their way to start a new mission in Palestine, promising to meet his family in France. The ship sank, their four children were drowned. So Spafford wrote the verses in mid-Atlantic on his way over to join his bereaved wife. And they founded the Spafford Home for Children in Jerusalem, which is still there. And then he asked his friend Philip Bliss to write the music for his verses. On December 29th of that same year, Bliss and his wife were taking the Pacific Express from New York to Chicago. In a blinding snowstorm, the train crossed a bridge near Ashtabula, Ohio. The bridge gave way, dragging the passengers' cars, cars into the ravine below. Bliss survived, but a fire broke out. There were other survivors standing there, and they were watching. Fanned by gale-like winds, the wooden coaches now were ablaze. So Bliss managed to crawl back to safety through a window, but he now, finding that his wife was trapped under the, under the ironwork of the seats, he returned to the car. You, know, you can imagine people watching, oh no, this is fire breaking out. He remained at her side trying to help her, but sadly, the flames took their toll. No trace of their bodies was ever discovered. But when his luggage was recovered, they found in his trunk that he'd been working in his trunk that he'd been working on a new hymn. It was unfinished, but the opening line was this: "I know not what awaits me. God kindly veils my eyes." And the context, you know, of what was taking place is just so profound. More than twelve thousand people attended the memorial service led again by D.L. Moody, held for them in Chicago. You know, sometimes God rescues his Daniels by taking them home. And sometimes returning us to continue serving him on earth. Will you dare to be a Daniel? Dare to stand alone? Dare to have a purpose firm? Dare to make it known. May God help each one of us to dare to be a Daniel this week. Lord, how we thank you for your word. How we thank you for the example of Daniel. Help us indeed, Lord, to dare to be a Daniel for you this week. In Jesus' name we pray this.
Amen. Glory to God.